Hi, this is David Liss from Impact Church, and uh, we've been studying the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to be in chapter 14, but before we go there, let me just say this, just to restate it, Moses is giving the children of Israel the last instructions that he would pass on to the new generation. Moses would not be going in with them, but this generation of people would be going in to, to possess the land that had been promised to their forefathers. So Moses is passing the baton to the next generation. He's instructing them so that they could go on to the fulfillment of their promise. When I think of the book of Deuteronomy, I really think of vital things that God is communicating to a people that he's desiring to make into the nation of his choosing for them to go in and possess what he has called them to possess. So reflecting from that perspective onto the Christian life, I'm looking for principles in this book that help us to live as a people who are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And it may not be that all the, the legalistic uh, laws may be put into place, but the principles that are there need to be binding on our hearts, just like it was binding on theirs. And the sense of a new identity and a people after God needs to be a part of our perspective also. How do we identify ourselves? We identify ourselves as the people of God, a people who are called by his name, set apart for him. So without any further ado, let's invite the Holy Spirit into this process and ask him to, to uh, guide us through our, our study. Lord, we thank you for your word because there's plenty in these scriptures to keep us busy for the rest of our life. Uh, and when we know it all, we can just start memorizing it all. And Lord, we know that it, it's... Uh, the deeper that you get into it, it's like you can get a higher powered microscope and find that there's even more depth. And then that one is insufficient. And the deeper you go, you find out there's even more that's yet to be uncovered. But Holy Spirit, would you guide us in our study and apply to our lives things that are pertinent for us and help us to live as the people that we've been called to live as. And Lord, we'll give you the glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's start off with verse 1. And it, this is chapter 14 again, and verse 1, it says, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or shave the front of your heads for the dead. What in the world? This culturally does not seem relevant to us, but what he's telling, what he's telling them is that although the nations around them had certain practices that they did when they were trying to mourn or show the sincerity of their mourning, and a lot of those things were even included in their pagan worship. But cutting of the flesh, they would physically cut their bodies. They would shave themselves to make themselves look like something was wrong so that people could identify that they were mourning. And God did not want his own people to appear to be a people that were without hope. And the cutting of the flesh, the harming of themselves would not do any good for the person who had passed, it wouldn't do any good for them, and it didn't represent them as a people of hope. But because they're God's people, God's telling them, I want you to do differently. I want you to look and act differently than the pagan nations. Church, we should not be trying to look like the world. We shouldn't be acting like the world. We shouldn't be doing like they do. And we should not be responding as though we don't have hope because God has given us hope. And he goes on, and the reason why he tells them not to do this, look at verse 2. He started out and said, you are the children of the Lord. Verse 2, he continues, said, for, I, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And uh, other translations say a peculiar people. A distinct people. The word there is actually the word that's used for a jewel or something that would be locked away, something that would be, be cherished and made secure. And so he's telling his people, look, you're different than everybody else. It doesn't mean you're better by your own nature, but you are different because you've been chosen. As believers in, in, in Christianity and in, uh, and in Jesus Christ, we believe that, yes, we are different, we are peculiar, we are treasured, and we have been chosen. But we also believe that this, this choosing is something that God desires for the nations of the world. So we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. 
we may have a distinction of already been chosen and separated to the Lord, but God's desire is that we share this truth with other people so that other people can join us in the treasure chest of the Lord, that we are his special treasure. So number one in this passage, he's reinforcing the fact that we have a distinct identity from the rest of the world. And we need to preserve that distinction. Don't try to be like, don't try to act like, don't try to measure up, and don't try to be accepted by the world. Live as a distinct people. Be different and be okay with that because you're chosen and set apart for the Lord. Then he goes on and understanding that because they were the people of God, God was giving them directives on things that would be beneficial for them, things that would preserve them, and things that would help them be different from the nations around them. And he goes into a passage here, and we won't spend a whole lot, lot of time reading this, but I just want to summarize this. He gives them for directives for what type of meat they could and should eat. And he also gives some, some understanding. Uh, but he really doesn't explain explicitly in this why some things are considered clean and unclean. But let's just go on just a little bit. Number one, he lists off in verse 4, um, some of the animals that were okay for them to eat. And this is from the, the New King James Version. Some of the wording and the description of the animals may be different in some of the, the other versions. But in the New King James, it says, these are the animals which you may eat, the ox or beef, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, and the mountain goat, and the antelope, and the mountain sheep. And so he's given them a list of animals that was okay for them to eat meat from. He basically defines that they are allowed to eat meat from animals that had a cloven hoof. So they had a hoof that was split in two like this, but also animals that chewed the cud. So those were two prerequisites. One is that it had to have a cloven hoof, and the other is that it also chewed the cud. So if it had a cloven hoof but didn't chew the cud, no. If it chewed the cud but didn't have a cloven hoof then that was out also. And uh, he does go and he, he even gives a list of animals like a camel and a hare. Now this word for hare here is not necessarily what we understand. Uh, from what I've read and studied, it says that this they're not exactly clear what this animal is, and it may be an animal that has become extinct. Um, but uh, the, the hare and also a rock hyrax. A rock hyrax is something that I'm familiar with um, but it is an animal that is similar to um, uh, a guinea pig uh, in, in size and nature. But yeah, you can look up a rock hyrax if you're interested in doing that and figure out what they was. But you're not supposed to eat it because it does chew the cud, but it doesn't have a cloven hoof. Then he goes along and he talks about, about swine and that they are not supposed to be, to be eaten by Jewish law. He says, don't even, don't even touch the unclean things. Don't even touch their dead, get dead carcasses. He goes on and starts talking about another kind of creature. He starts talking about fish in verse 9. And basically, to be quick at this, he says that, that you can only eat fish. The only fish that you are allowed to eat are fish that have fins and scales. So no fish that had just skin. And uh, if it came out of the water... It was supposed to have fins and scales if they were to eat it. And uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that. You can go in and find studies on that. But I'm trying to do a quick quick study here. Also, when it comes to birds, he gives a list, list of birds that are not allowed to eat from verse uh, 11 through 20. And a lot of the birds that are identified there are birds that are scavengers and eat meat or flesh of some kind. Um, and uh, he does name some other unusual things like a stork and a heron and a hoopoo, I did a little study on that, but won't take the time to do that right now. And then he says, don't eat bats. Well, that is in relevance to us with this whole coronavirus thing going on. But he says here, don't eat bats. And then he goes on, he identifies, speaks about, about insects. He said, anything that cr crawls on the ground and flies with regards to an insect that they were not supposed to eat. And this is a little bit interesting because when you go back to uh, Leviticus chapter 11 and he gives prescriptions for insects that they could or could not eat, he does tell them there that they were able to eat locusts and crickets and grasshoppers. So those things were allowed, but the other things that crawled on the ground and had wings, they weren't supposed to eat. Um, he leaves out the locusts and crickets and grasshoppers here, so they're not specified. Um, 
but basically he restates in verse 20 that you could eat all clean birds. And then he goes on and talks to them about how, this is verse 21, that you are, may not eat an animal that dies on its own. In other words, they could only eat uh, ceremonially killed animals, animals that were killed and then the blood was drained out of them. And uh, if you found an animal that's already dead, you cannot eat that. They said you can give it to the alien, sell it to the alien or the foreigner. They can eat it. They're not a part of the covenant, but you Jewish people, you cannot eat this. And part of the reasoning behind that was that animal that died, the blood wasn't necessarily drained out of it. And the prescription was that Israelite people, God's people were not allowed to eat the blood because the life was in the blood and that God was the, the, the one who uh, was the one who provided life. And so that was a part of honoring God that you didn't eat something that had blood in it. Um, I'm going to move on down to verse 22. He kind of takes a shift in the passage right here and begins talking about tithing. And tithing is an interesting subject. He emphasizes here, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain. And he goes on and elaborates that it includes the grain, the new wine, the oil, the, first, the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Basically, he's saying that you, you shall, he says, truly tithe all of the increase. And he's emphasizing that a part of the process of tithing is that we learn to fear or respect the Lord. What's he saying here? Look, it's helping us to understand that everything that we have, everything we own, is actually truly owned by the Lord. We're just made temporary stewards over it. And so understanding that we are the Lord's and uh, that we are under his his ownership means that we also honor the Lord by giving the tithe. There's an argument as to whether or not the tithe is, is a, a part of the old covenant or the new covenant. The reality is from scripture, tithing preceded there being an Old Testament. And it's a, a part of having a giving heart, a part of recognizing who our God is. And also, I mean, a, a, an added benefit. I remember when I was a child and my dad was teaching me about this. I said, so dad, that means that tithing and giving offerings is really a good investment. Because the Lord said he would bless it. He said, don't think of it like that. I got uh, rebuked a little bit for that because I said, it's kind of like an investment. He said, no, don't think of it like that. It's obedience to the Lord. But God does command a blessing that goes along with the tithe. And in the provision, where the, it's interesting because the tithe wasn't just a giving. There was a giving that was involved. But when they brought these animals, when they brought this the, the grain, when they brought the wine, when they brought the, the, uh, the olive oil to the temple, God also gave them an opportunity to participate with uh, him in the meal. So they got to celebrate the tithe, celebrate the increase, celebrate the blessing of the Lord. And he even gave provision for them that if they lived too far away from the temple, that when it came time to come, that they could sell the things at the, at the distance where they were and then come to the temple and replenish their, their giving by buying things near the temple that they could then celebrate that, that, uh, that meal with. And he says in verse 27, don't forget the Levite. Levites didn't have a possession. They did not have land of their own. And so God wanted to make sure that in their giving and in their celebrating that they didn't leave the Levite out, that the Levites who served the temple actually received uh, a part of that, that blessing, a part of that provision as well. That's how they, they were supported. That's how the temple of the Lord was supported. And then there's a distinction in the tithe. If you look at verse 28, where it says, every third year you shall bring out the tithe of your produce and store it up within your gates. And there was a, a special part of the tithe every third year that was brought to make sure, and it was a provision to help out the Levites and the, the widows and the stranger, the foreigners and the fatherless. And so a part of the reason why a tithe was given was to see to it that the needs were met for people who did not have their own, their own way of providing for themselves or people who were destitute, people who did not have their own um, a benefactor, didn't have land of their own, or didn't have some, some way of providing for themselves. So benevolence was involved in the giving. And it still is today when we give to the Lord, we also trust that our churches or ministries are reaching out and helping people that have need. And it says that they should give this tithe 
so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. So again, we can look at Malachi, the teaching on the tithe there, but even here in these early principles about tithing and giving that God was mandating for his people, a part of the reason why the tithe was there was so that they would learn to fear the Lord. They would respect the Lord as, as their God and as the owner of all things. They would be able to fellowship with the Lord through the tithe, that the needs of people would be met who, who couldn't uh, didn't have the means to take care of themselves, but also so that God would, it would open a door of blessing into the lives of, of God's followers. And it, the same applies to us today. Um, the, the, the Bible talks about the fact that you can't outgive God. If you give and take care of someone that's in need, if you bless, then God's going to bless you also. So thank you for being with us. I hope this is a blessing. I encourage you to read through that passage, and hopefully our comments have, have helped you out a little bit. But uh, we are going to be having our Bible study tonight over Zoom. And if you've already seen this, then you'll be better prepared for that. We'll get to discuss a little bit more. May the Lord bless you as God blesses his word and applies it to your life. We love you. Goodbye.